Okay. Last session. The time goes very quickly. That means you are happy. If the time is going very quickly, it means you are happy. It is said that uh, for Buddha, one eon is one moment. And when we suffer, one minute is <laughs> like many days. Time is not passing, you know. When you're happy, time passes so quickly. So I, I, I think we are happy, which is good, which is good. Then probably I said on the first day that what I'm talking about may be something that you already know. So for me, it is really like preaching the converts who are already good. Although I have got this seat a little bit bigger than you, but actually in terms of knowledge, experience, practice, many of you may be much, much better than me. So, so by saying this, what I'm trying to say is we need to recognize our good things also. So don't just say negative emotion, suffering, then war and conflict, then the world is hopeless, not just that. That's just one side of the story, right? The bigger side of the story is, for example, your being here is a great indication of your wish to do good and your wish to do good not only for yourself but for many people, which is the purpose of our human life. Right? So you have every reason to be happy. You may not be perfect, but comparatively, physically also we are well. We have got both the eyes intact, both the legs intact, both the hands intact. And we are able to, you know, participate in such Dharma teachings. Very lucky, very lucky. So be happy with all the things that you have. Shantideva in his Bodhicharya Avatara, he says <coughs> that you have food today and you are also finding your livelihood. You are also free from any sickness, particular sickness. So this is a glorious day. That's what he says. This is a glorious day. Right? So be happy. Live in the moment. Don't get lost in the past and future. Yes, you need to learn something from the past and also do certain planning for the future also, but don't waste your life just thinking about what has happened in the past, recalling the wrongdoings of people, recalling your sufferings in your childhood and then feel miserable, you know, right? Tomorrow nobody knows. Tomorrow you will be here or not. Today is cash. <laughs> it's not a post-dated check. <laughs> right? Today you should be happy. Tomorrow you should be happy. Then like that you will always be happy. But if you, if you think, okay, now I have to work very hard, earn money, then I will go for a holiday, then I will be happy, you know. I'll look for a nice partner. When I get that man and woman, then, then I will be happy. The happiness will never come through this process. You know, when you are young, you think that I study, finish my college, then I will be happy. When you finish your college, you need to go to university. Then you think I go to university, then I will be happy. When you f finish your university, then you think about getting married, thinking that you will be happy. When you get married, then, then you think, I should have two, three children, then I will be happy. Then you have two, three children, still not you are happy. Now the question is where, where you should send these children, which, which school, <laughs> how much money you have to pay for their fee, you know. And then children also sometimes, you know, they, they, 
don't live up to your expectation, you're happy, and it, things like that. It's it's continuous thing. So whatever be the case, you know, we have to go through all these processes, but the important thing is be happy today. Be happy today. That That is important. And when you're happy, you will be good. If you're good, not necessarily that you're happy. When you're happy, you will be good. Right? So therefore it is really important. All these teachings are for happiness, for peace. So be happy. Whether you live like 100 years or 70 years, that's not the question. The question is <laughs> how you live. If you live for 10 years, okay, good. Like that. So, since we have kind of completed teaching the three principal aspects of the path, then as announced earlier, I will speak a little bit about the four seals, four buddhi seals. All conditioned things are impermanent, all contaminated things are suffering, all phenomena are selfless, empty and selfless, nirvana is peace. That is four seals. But if you read many of the sutras and commentaries, you, you will find many versions. Sometimes they call it four seals, sometimes they call it three seals, sometimes they call it four summaries or three summaries. They are different, so many. But these four seals, the interesting, the, the, if you try to find a correlation of this teaching on the four seals and Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truth. As I mentioned earlier, Buddha taught the first teaching that the Buddha gave us on Four Noble Truth, right? And out of which the first teaching was Truth of the Suffering. And when he taught the Truth of Suffering, he explained it, explained it with four features. Right? Impermanence, suffering, Emptiness, selflessness. Four features he taught it. Right? Now, with regard to these four seals also, when Buddha was passing away, he was on his deathbed and giving his final teachings. So sometimes you should read the life history of the Buddha also. Very important. There are many, many books telling a detail the stories. You know, he was, he's, he's, Buddha is not a god, not a creator. He was also an ordinary human being like you and me. He also struggled and then gradually found the way, right? So in this connection, I just want to read a little bit about um, I forgot to bring my eyeglass. Huh? Oh, maybe here, maybe not here, I don't know. Yeah, a little bit is here. This is a, a statement from Somi Vivekananda. Somi Vivekananda is a, a really, really great person, Indian gentleman. I I used I was very fond of him even when when I was relatively young. I used to carry his small book and go around and read it. Very inspiring. So here he says, I want to read this. Buddhism is historically the most important religion. I'm not trying to prove it the most important religion, but just simply reading what he said. Buddhism is historically the most important religion because it was the most tremendous movement the world ever saw. The most gigantic spiritual wave ever to burst upon human society. There is no civilization on which its effect has not been felt in some way or the other. The followers of Buddha were most enthusiastic and very missionary in spirit. They were the first not to remain content with the limited sphere of their Mother Church, they, they traveled east and west, north and south. They went into Persia, 
Asia Minor, Russia, Poland, China, Korea, Japan, Burma, Siam, and beyond. And uh, this missionary activities probably was not really trying to convert anybody. This you need to un again understand properly. Right? But to, even though your motivation is not to convert people, but it is your responsibility to share the wisdom, the nectar, the good news. And it's up to the people whether they want to listen to it or follow it or not. It's up to them, but it's very important. If you have genuine compassion and love to help certain beings remove their suffering, then you need to go around and share it. And His Holiness did exactly that. He's been traveling tirelessly around the world, giving talks and teachings. Not to make him popular or famous or collect money, things like that. You know, he got so many titles and requested from so many organizations, please be the chairman, please be this, be that. He did not do anything. And even when he got his Nobel Peace Prize, it's a lot of money. He did not give it with him and then do something which will make him popular. You know, you can do all these things. He has the power. He didn't do it. He gave it to somebody to, to you know, do something which is in harmony with this Nobel Peace Prize, right? So I have many, many stories to tell about what His Holiness is doing, right? So th this should be understood in the right context. The civilization of India has died and revived several times. This is its peculiarity. At the time Buddha was born, India was in need of a great spiritual leader. There was a most powerful body of priests, the Brahmins. Understand that Swami Vivekananda is a Hindu. Okay, he's not against Hindu. So understand that also. There was a most powerful body of priests, the Brahmins. Begin to the Brahmins begin to arrogate powers and privil privileges to themselves. If a Brahmin killed a man, he would not be punished. So much respect. Right? Even the most wicked Brahmin must be worshipped. So that's why right in the beginning I was telling, you know, monks also, there are so many different monks, you should, you know, distinguish who is the right, who is the wrong, teacher also, so many things. That's what I was saying. So the wicked Brahmins or wicked monks being worshipped is uh, wrong. We should not do this anymore now. Even the most wicked Brahmin must be worshipped. Two thousand ceremonies they had invented. <laughs> India was full of it in Buddha's day. Now if you talk about the forecast and all the systems, I don't want to get into that broil, but a lot of things are there. And the ceremonies were mostly for marriages and the king's enthronement and those, so those things, not so much for the public. There is a gentleman called, uh, I think, L.M. Joshi. Are you familiar? L.M. Joshi, who wrote a book in which he mentioned, I met uh, his daughter some years back. He, Joshi, I think, passed a long time back. So in that book, he, s he outlined four, four reasons why Buddhism disappeared from India. One reason was, the Buddhist priests priest also followed the Brahman way of participating in all the ceremonial activities so that they can, you know, get closer to the king and the ruler and then the rich people, you know, joining their marriage ceremony, things like that. That was one cause he highlighted. The other day somebody asked a question about the, the relevance of rituals also. Yes, ritual has its own benefit. If you, if you go too much into the ceremony and ritual, then this will lead to uh, degeneration of the Buddha's teaching. Because Buddha's teaching must be studied and understood, and applied, not just playing musical instruments. It's only a medium, small medium to, to attract people, to gather people. Okay. At last, one man could bear it no more. He had the brain, the power, and the heart, a heart as infinite as the broad sky. He learned why men suffer, 
and he found the way out of suffering we discussed already. Buddha was the first great preacher of equality. Every man and woman had the same right to attain spirituality. No caste system. No difference between men and women. He opened the door of nirvana to one and all. Even the lowest were entitled to highest attainment. Because this is the, the in terms of your achievement of enlightenment and so forth, this this is nothing to do with you know, whether you're rich or not. It has to do with your mental power. And everybody has that mental power. His teaching was bold even for India. The religion of Buddha spread fast. It was because of the marvelous love which for the first time in the history of, of humanity devoted itself to the service not only of all men but of all living beings, sentient beings. Buddha's idea is that there is no God, only man himself. He repudiated the mentality which underlies the prevalent ideas of God. He found it, he found it made men weak and superstitious. The other day I explained about science coming out from metaphysics. Everything independent is happy. Everything dependent is miserable. All my life, I have been very fond of Buddha. I have more veneration for that character than for any other. That boldness, that fearlessness, and the tremendous love. He was born for the good of man. He sought truth because people were in misery. How to help them was his only concern. And consider his marvelous brain. Believe, marvelous brain, brain means he said, believe, believe not because an old manuscript says so, but think for yourself. Search truth for yourself, realize it yourself. Then if you find it beneficial, give it to other people also. And consider his death. He ate food offered to him by an outcast, a chandal. Even though his followers told him, okay, don't eat, this is poisoned, you know, meat. He said, no, 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 this is his request. I must eat that. And then he got sick. He told his disciples not to eat this. Uh, he told his disciples, he told his disciples not to eat this food. But he said, I cannot refuse, refuse it. Go to the man and tell him he has done me one of the greatest services of my life. He has released me from this body. He was not committing suicide, but he's giving a teaching there also. His method of work and organization was quite striking. The idea that we have today of church is his creation. He organized the monks and made them into a body. Even the voting by ballot is there, 560 years before Christ. It was the foundation of Christian religion. The Catholic Church came from Buddhism. He was the only man who was even ready to give up his life for animals to stop a sacrifice. He once said to a king, if the sacrifice of a lamb helps you go to heaven, sacrificing a man will help you better, so sacrifice me. This man set in motion the highest moral ideas any people can have. To many, the path becomes easier if they believe in God. But the life of Buddha shows that even a man who does not believe in God, who has no metaphysics, who belongs to no sect, and who does not go to church or temple, and is a confessed materialist, see? He's talking about our life. <laughs> confessed materialist. Even he can attain the highest. So there is a longer version. This is the shorter version of Sumi Vivekananda and what he said about Buddha. So. Anyway, he, of course, finally he passed. There's a long story. And then I want to read this last parting advice that he said when he was on his deathbed. Then, then the blessed one addressed the brethren and said, Behold now, brethren, I exhort you, saying, Decay is inherent in all component things, 
work out your salvation with diligence. This was the last word of the Tathagata. So in fact, you know, the longer version says that decays, decays inherent in everything impermanent work for your salvation. That means you make, make effort, make effort. Then he said, now if you have any doubt, any question about my teaching that I've been giving, especially about interdependent origination, four noble truths, two truths, and so forth, ask me the question. I'll answer you. Right? So it is in this process. And then he said, okay, now I'm, I'm going, so please look at my body carefully. It's not easy to get this opportunity to see a Buddha's body. So he removed his, the cloth of his upper body and asked them to see. And then he said, all conditioned things are impermanent. All contaminated things are suffering. All phenomena are empty and selfless. Nirvana is peace. So his death is not ordinary death. He is passing into Nirvana. Right? Nirvana is peace. So that was his parting advice. Now you should see the first teaching that he gave us on the truth of suffering, characterized by the features, impermanence, suffering, selflessness, and so forth. The last teaching he gave us also impermanence. If you understand this transient, fleeting, impermanent, nature of everything in general and especially yourself. He's not talking so much about the tree is impermanent and not so much. He's primarily talking about you. <laughs> you are impermanent. Now you are impermanent means anything that is conditioned is impermanent. But in your case he's saying he's not saying that you are impermanent because of a specific, you know, kind of cause and condition. He's especially pinpointing by saying that you permanent you are impermanent, you will change, you will die primarily due to the cause of negative emotions and contaminated actions. So once you understand that, the first line, the all compounded or conditioned things are impermanent, then naturally you will know that in your case you are not only impermanent but you also have this nature of suffering because, because what made you change is due to negative emotions and contaminated actions. So it's because of this reason that you are, you are, you are impermanent, you are also subject to suffering. But if you look at this person that is impermanent, that is suffering, and then if you try to closely find out the real nature of this person, the nature of this person is such that, that this person is empty and selfless. Empty and selfless. Now, empty and selfless means that normally we tend to, as I briefly mentioned earlier, normally for ordinary people who never question these things, they think that I and my body are separate. They don't question, but they think like that. It's, it's an inborn way of thinking that I'm something independent from the body, permanent from the body right? and, and unitary, just one person. Those, that's what, what we think. And then those people who have some kind of philosophy, in India there are many, many different philosophies. So they, through, unlike the ordinary person, when they analyze a little bit, then they say, oh, the person should be as ordinary people even thought without asking question, even with the questioning, they think, oh, the person should be different from the body. It makes sense, because I also said the person is not your body, not your mind, so they think like that. So this person, not only independent from the body, but this person is permanent. The person will go from this life to another life, things like that. So it is independent from its dependent dependence on the psychophysical aggregate. Things like that. So many philosophical traditions came into being. Right? 
So this is refuted. There is, according to the Madhyamika school of thought, there is no person, individual person, that is permanent, solitary, independent. Because the person is dependent on the body, right? Therefore, it is not independent. It is changing. Therefore, it is not permanent. So empty, empty means empty of such a self. Empty and selfless. Selflessness means the word self here does not refer to the ordinary I, but here self refers to inherent existence. Meaning that whether it is a person or a phenomena, there is nothing that has inherent independent existence, which we already discussed. Now, even among Buddhist schools of thought, the first two schools of thought, Vyabhashika and Sautantika, they don't talk about selflessness of phenomena. They talk only about selflessness of the person. So in the case of the person, there is a grosser selflessness of the person and subtler selflessness of the person, but they don't talk about selflessness of phenomena. Then the mind only circle, the Chitta Mother also talk about selflessness of person and selflessness of phenomena. And then Madhyamikas, of course. So according, according to the mind only school of thought, selflessness of person or phenomena means lack of substantial separate, lack of substantial, you know, separateness of the subject and object. The subject which appears to you right now and the mind which perceives that object, they are substantially same. What you are seeing around is awakening of the imprint that is left on your mind. They are not there externally as you think. They appear to you because of the activation of your imprint on your mind. So substantially they are same. That's, that's what they say. But this is also refuted by the Prasangika Madhyamika school. Now according to the Prasangika Madhyamika school, whether it's a subject or object, you know, I or phenomena, there's no phenomena which has inherent, independent, true existence. Right? Because everything is de designated. Everything is designated. For example, the, to put a small example, for example, even if you have a, let us say, your, your child who goes to the school and the teacher has given some homework to do and the child solves, does that homework by himself, then he can say, I did it myself. But if he is helped by the parents and other elder people, then the child cannot say, I did it myself. So similarly, when things are dependent on causes and conditions and designations, we cannot say it exists by itself. It is dependent. Therefore, there is nothing that has inherent independent existence. So that is the meaning of all phenomena being empty and selfless. And once you understand this nature of emptiness and selflessness, then you will be able to act against that ignorance which we already discussed. Now you are all scholars on this subject, right? Right? So you know, then, then you are able to remove that misconception of reality, that there's nothing that has inherent independent existence, and then that counteracts against that misconception of seeing things as having independent inherent existence, then that wisdom understanding emptiness becomes the counter force to completely eradicate ignorance. And once you completely remove ignorance and it is seed, then you achieve nirvana. And once you achieve nirvana, there's no falling back. It's not like us, we are happy today, tomorrow not so happy, healthy today, tomorrow not so healthy, it's not like that. Then there is permanent happiness. Therefore, nirvana is peace. There's the meaning. It's your mental state of having removed negative emotions. Nirvana is peace. So these four are called four seals, meaning that if you 
or somebody who really follows Buddhist philosophy. There is a Buddhist conduct, there is a Buddhist, Buddhist behavior and conduct, there is a Buddhist philosophy. Now in terms of Buddhist behavior and conduct, if you take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, then by conduct you are a Buddhist. If you don't do that, you can get some get good messages and teachings from in the Buddha, but you are not Buddhist still. So to the demarcation to become Buddhist is whether you, ho not just saying I am Buddhist. Even among Tibetans, many who say Buddhist, they may not be, philosophically speaking, strictly speaking, they may not be Buddhist. Because a real Buddhist is somebody who takes Buddha Dharma and who takes refuge in Buddha Dharma and Sangha. Wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly means taking refuge. What does that mean? Taking refuge is not something peculiar to the Buddhist teaching. It is in the human nature. Long, long ago we lived in the cave. That means we are taking refuge in the cave. At 12 o'clock today, when you are hungry, you will take refuge in your lunch. And then after the teaching is over, if you want to go down, it suddenly rains, then you take refuge in umbrella. So this process of taking refuge in someone, when you are unable to solve this problem by yourself, it's in the human nature. You seek help, you take refuge in somebody. That's in the human nature. So therefore, true to this human nature, in Buddhism also, if you become a Buddhist, that means you take refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Now here it is important to understand who these three guys are. Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Why should one take refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha? Right? So as I said, when you say I take refuge in Buddha, Dharma and Sangha, you are actually saying I have some problem. <laughs> I have some problem. I need help. So here in this case, you are not saying I have problem of shortage of money or shortage of friends. You are not talking about small problems. You are talking about a major problem. I have this major problem of being afflicted by the negative emotions. I have this major pro problem of getting stuck in the samsara, cycle of existence. So I am looking for somebody who can help me. And when I searched around, I found the three ratana, the three objects of Buddha, Dharma and Sangha as the most reliable object of refuge. So when you say this, you need to have a clear understanding of, as I said, who these three are, Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. Now let us, then, then we can also, also think about, like, okay, you take refuge, okay, but why three? It should be just one, so that it is simpler. Or it should be many, so that you feel you are really guarded on all sides. <laughs> so why just three? There's only three. There are many reasons. In other teachings also, they, 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 they give numbers, like seven cardinal sins. If you read about why these seven cardinal sins were invented, it's so interesting. I have a book on that. <laughs> so that people are able to remember. Close to that, Buddhists also we have ten non-virtuous actions. So that people remember, right? So that may be one reason. But the main reason is when you physically become sick, especially very ill, you need primarily three helpers. One is the doctor, the physician. Second is the medicine. Third is the compounder, the nurse, or your brother, sister, somebody to help you. You need, when you physically become sick, you need three. A good doctor, Good doctor's prescription is not enough if you don't take the medicine. So you need medicine. Now you are not only sick, but you are terribly sick. So you also need somebody to help you. So Sangha, Buddha is like that physician. Dharma is the medicine. Sangha is the compounder, nurse. So, so like, like, you know, the, the, the physical. When you're physically sick, you need these three. So similarly, mentally also we are sick with negative emotions. What do you mean by sickness? Sickness means when things are not going well. When these negative emotions are there, things don't go well. So you are sick basically. Right? Right? So in order to cure this 
And this, this, this sickness is more dangerous than ordinary sickness. This is a very strong, continuous, lingering effect, difficult to rectify. So you really need a qualified teacher who can guide. So Buddha gave all these 100,000 teachings to cure that illness. These are all his pres prescriptions, right? So this, these teachings, they are the medicine. So Buddha has done his job. Even right now we have access to 108 volumes of his teachings translated into Tibetan. Most of them are now lost in the original Sanskrit, but we have that in Tibetan. All those 108 volumes, right? So, Buddha has done his job. Now our job is to realize that I'm sick with these negative emotions and take the medicine. Practice the teaching. Otherwise, even if you have all these beautiful altars and the scriptures up there, they'll, they're, they're not going to solve your problem. That's why the Buddha said, I have shown you the path to liberation. Liberation is up to you. I am just your teacher, you have to act. The Buddhas do not wash the sins of sentient beings with the water. The Buddhas cannot remove the sufferings of sentient beings with their hand. The Buddhas cannot transfer their knowledge and realization into your brain, into your mind. They can only show the path of the truth. If you practice it, you will be liberated. If you don't practice it, you will not be liberated. Right? So even though Buddha has given this wonderful teaching and uh, the, um, the amazing, you know, uh, Dharma is also available. But if you have nobody to support, nobody to inspire, it will be very difficult. So right now you all feel quite happy because you are of more or less of similar <laughs> intention, wanting to do something good, wanting to practice Dharma. So all of you are inspiring each other. For example, if Tushita made this announcement, and then only one person runs out. They will cancel the teaching. Right? Or if you go back to a place or a country where hardly anybody is talking about it, then it's more difficult for you. But if you're surrounded by, by many people who do this practice, then it is very easy to organize things and talk about it and study it. Right? So Sangha, community, of good people is very, very important. So, with this realization, now who is this Buddha? Buddha is, in nutshell, Buddha is said to be somebody who is compassionate and who is omniscient or knowledgeable. Knowledgeable means he can teach. Compassionate means he will not cheat you, deceive you, exploit you. He has no personal agenda. So he's a perfect teacher in that sense. And about his Dharma, the core principle of his dharma is compassion again. As I said the other day, if you have one practice, you have all the practices. That one practice is compassion. Right? And Sangha. Sangha means those who are spiritually intended in doing good things. In Tibetan it is called Gendun. Sangha is translated as Gendun, somebody who is aspired somebody who has this aspiration to do good things, that is called Sangha. Of course, the literal meaning means group, community, right? One who is interested in the virtuous practices, that is called Sangha. So this is a Sangha. Sangha does not mean monks. Sometimes for the monks we call it Sangha. But Sangha means all of you who want to do good practice, that is Sangha, coming together, that is Sangha. So these three are needed. So, with this realization of the greatness of the Buddha, his teaching and so forth, then you decide, I want to become a Buddhist. Then you become a Buddhist. There's not a special ritual to be performed. Somebody sprinkling water on you and then say, oh, now you're a Buddhist. You can do that also, but that is not, not the real thing. The real way of becoming Buddhist is you first study, think for yourself. 
If you think this is good for you, do it. If you don't think this is good for you, don't do it. Nobody has been forced in doing that. So what I'm trying to say is, as His Holiness always says, don't get converted without thinking. For, for example, if you come from a very strong Christian community or Muslim community, things like that, you are surrounded by all these people, you see. So it may not be easy for you to become a black sheep <laughs> among the society. <laughs> it may not be easy, right? So therefore, think properly. We never encourage people becoming Buddhist. That is not our job. We are not interested in increasing the population. We are interested in making good people. Right? So it, so it is up to you. But if you want to become Buddhist, then I'm telling you this is the process. The door to become a Buddhist is taking refuge to Buddha, Dharma and Sangha. The door to become a Mahayanist is cultivation of Bodhicitta. The door to undergo tantric practice is initiation, empowerment. There are three doors. If you want to enter those three doors, this is the process. That is what I'm saying. Okay? So therefore, this teaching on the Four Noble Truths and teaching on the Four Seals, these are really like the crux of the Buddha's teachings. That's what he taught in the beginning. That's what he taught on the last day. So pay more attention, read more. Now when you read more, even with true suffering, it has impermanence, it is suffering, it is selflessness. So understand all this clearly. And uh, yeah, similarly with the other four, other truths also. So take time and uh, study in more detail. Luckily now there are many books in English also available. So in Hindi also, there are quite a number of books. Not so much, but there are quite a number of books. And in other languages also, there are books available now. In German or Russian, you know, books are available. So read more and listen to <coughs> more teachings. Right? That's the process. And the important thing is, just as it is not enough for us to eat one meal one day, we need to eat three, four times. So similarly for your spiritual upliftment, also you need to practice three, four, five, six times a day. Keep in touch with the Dharma continuously. And that keeping in touch you cannot do just with the mobile phone, but primarily mentally you should keep in touch and try to get some authentic books. Make sure you buy authentic books. Don't read all kinds of books. Some of them may not be so authentic. <laughs> because when it comes to explaining the Dharma, unless you have a very proper understanding, a deeper understanding, it's not that easy to explain it. So some, some people might explain it just to make other people happy. Right? What should, what, what should I say now? Yeah, that's all. Ask some questions. Yeah. <clears throat> it's not so much a question, but a, a request, mm. but it's not a puja. Mm. It's a long life prayer for Keshe Lakdor Losang Jordan. Born in the year of the fire monkey in the shadow of a precious snow mountain, you soared high above Mount Maru. In this way, you reside within. To my precious guru, I bow down. Please live long and remain until samsara ends. Before your sixth year in caves, you recited many mantras and prayers, then risked everything in order to live a life of dharma. You strove to make your precious birth a wish-granting gem. Without these actions, I would not be. To my precious guru, I give thanks. Please live long and remain until samsara ends. In the land of Buddha's enlightenment, you obtained inconceivable knowledge and wisdom, giving all you have to help others. 
just one of your teachings embodies all and awakens. To my precious guru who humbles, please live long and remain until samsara ends. For 16 years, you tended to the guardian of the land of snows, translated many books to expand Dharma's light, perfectly embodying Chinrezi's wishes without unwavering devotion, I mean with unwavering devotion, patient with those whose faith is less. To my precious guru who inspires, please live long and remain until samsara ends. Through your wondrous powers, every one of your words has great meaning. All of your actions ripple through time, producing innumerable benefit. You abide in emptiness, living life by means of dependent arising. I endeavor to become like you. To my precious guru, who I always admire and respect, please live long and remain until samsara ends. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I tell you the bitter truth. <laughs> <laughs> number one, number one, I highly, highly appreciate your good thoughts, but uh, I'm not somebody who has the choice to live and die whenever I want. <laughs> Far from it, I have no realization, nothing. The only one thing that I, I also not somebody who has great knowledge, somebody who has a great practice, I must confess it before you, okay? When I confess like that, many of you are going to desert me, so that's fine. <laughs> many of you are not going to listen to me again, that's fine. <laughs> okay, that's fine. So I don't want to cheat you, pretending that I have the capacity to live long, to help all sentient beings until the end of samsara and all those things. I don't have that capacity. But your, your wish is perfect. You can think positively like that. Right? And yes, I, I am trying my best to help a little bit to anybody, because that is how I was brought up. You know, by studying Buddhism to help others. Here also I'm not good. I'm, I'm not saying I'm good. But at least I'm making the attempt. Then interestingly, although I don't have that knowledge, don't have that realization, don't have this practice, but when you share a little bit of the good things that you have, which you, you can all do, please share the good knowledges that you have to others. That's very important. So with this understanding, I'm sharing a little bit to others. And strangely, strangely, it seems many people getting benefit. I would say it's like, like strange coincidence or whatever. You never, never know. So we all have, this is not something peculiar, unique with me. We all, we all have that capacity. You, all, you just need to count, you know, how many people you benefited. You, you have all done this. Because this is great. For example, in my case, I translated for His Holiness for 16 years, you know. Before that, yes, I was doing some translation and some people were asking some questions here and there. I answered it a little bit based on my little knowledge, things like that. Then I translated for His Holiness, many people know me. Then I, when I left his, uh, his teach, uh, uh, you know, working in his office, when His Holiness asked me to become the director of the library, then I, I really said, Hooray! I mean, it, it is great to serve His Holiness, but at least I'm on my own now. <laughs> so nobody will chase me, nobody will bother me, you know. You know, when I was translating for His Holiness, there were many people chasing me. Not because I'm you know, charismatic or great teacher or something like that, but because they expect that the translator might know something <laughs> about what His Holiness is. So they used to knock my door. My room was there, quite close to His Holiness' office. So. So, so I really said, hooray. <laughs> now, now I, of course, go to the office. That's my job Ad, as, an, as a director, administrator of the library, nine to five job. <laughs> you see? <laughs> yeah. And uh, then many people asked me, Gesila, how is your job in the library? Is it difficult? I said, it's up to me. If, if I work hard, it may be difficult. It may be challenging. If I don't work, it's very easy. 
It's very easy. The building was there, the chair for the director was there. So you, with this title, you just sit there and sign some checks, you know. It's really very, very, you know, good job for me. <laughs> and uh, my room is like a few steps. So you can just see, oh, one minute to the office. So I go one minute before. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to travel as in big cities like Sao Paulo and others, you know. Just for your job, you have to go two hours this way, two hours that way, you know. So I said, good. So nine to five, then we have Saturday, Sunday holidays, right? So I'll now read my Dharma. Maybe I'm, I'm quite good in translation. So I'll do some translation, things like that. That was my plan. Then unfortunately, unfortunately, people started coming. Geshe like, can you come and give us teaching in Israel? <laughs> then I accepted, oh, okay, this may be the last request. <laughs> One and the last request. Then more and more requests came, you know. So then gradually I had to accept all of this. Following the footsteps of His Holiness, His Holiness is traveling so much. And then some countries, His Holiness cannot go. I can go, like Singapore. I can go. His Holiness cannot go. The country, because I'm insignificant, I can go anywhere. You know, that's the greatness of being small, you know. <laughs> Not a celebrity. <laughs> so so I, I, I traveled around, like Israel, I might have gone at least 10 times. Russia, I must have gone more than 10 times. America, maybe 20, 30 times, like that, you know. So many countries giving talks a little bit, like that. Then, but still, I was not recording any of my talks and teachings. And uh, here in Dharamsala, also, some requests came to, you know, give teachings. I said, no, there are so many, His Holiness is here, so many great teachers here. Who am I to come on the screen and give a talk? It's disgrace. I did not accept. Then gradually some, some, some people said, you know, uh, people requested me to give talks for younger generation. Then I said, that's okay, younger generation. And then teach, give a talk in English. That's okay, because not many people speak in English. So I, I limited myself, because I know who I am, right? But then, then this online thing came. Then talks and teachings happened a few times online many people following. And unknowingly, many of these people who follow my talks and teachings online, they become my, like, almost like my students. Suddenly when I come out, go somewhere, there's, there's some people going to me like, Geshe-la. <laughs> What? <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> I, I have never met you before. Geshe-la, you give this teaching to me, it really changed my life. I, I'm not saying everybody is like that. There are few people like that, you see. Geshe-la, you really changed my life. I had this problem, that problem. I listened to your talk. But my talk is basically <laughs> the talk of the Buddha, <laughs> of His Holiness, nothing invented by me, you know. So I, it's, it's their greatness, not me. But anyway, through me, they are getting benefit. Then I said, okay, if this is so, then maybe let us you now keep some of my talks and teachings available. And then some, some of my Indian friends said, Geshe-la, you are stupid. I have, I have one Indian friend who almost said, geshe you are stupid. You, you give all these talks and teachings. You don't even have a website? What do you mean? <laughs> I'll pay for it. Let us, you know, make your website, put your talks and teachings online, put your translations on things, things like that. I said, okay, okay, okay. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so now because many people are getting benefit, then, you know, there is a Tibetan saying, if it is good for the wound, even if it is the dog's fate, it is okay, use it. <laughs> so now I'm seriously thinking to come up with a website and put some of the talks and teachings. The library is already putting many of my talks and teachings online. So that is the story. So the my, you know, although you made so much praise to me, but my only goodness is have a little bit wish to help others a little bit. That is there for sure. Then I served His Holiness for 16 years and still, you know, follow his footsteps, my teacher, and trying my best to, uh, not serving him, you know, serving others in accordance with his teaching, right? So that not only me, we should all do, those of you who have 
respect and devotion to His Holiness. We should all do, because He is now 90 years old. You know, although He may be a manifestation of many things, but He act, He appeared as a human being. He will be susceptible to all human frailty, right? So therefore it is our job, our responsibility, especially the younger generation, to bring forth this torch and share it with others. You don't have to sit on a big throne. Whenever there's a possibility, talk about the goodness of this thing, especially those people who are interested. Those who are not interested, forget. Those who are interested, share it. And also, you know, recommend some of the good books that you read. That is the way of, you know, disseminating the teaching. There's one reason I read so many books. I mean, not, you know, the whole book, but uh, whenever I, I see some good books, I buy it and read a little bit. And then I tell people, okay, this is really good book. You read it. Right? That's the thing. So thank you for your, for your support encouraging me. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you, Keshila, for all the teachings, really taking back a lot of implementable things. Um, so my question is around parenting and passing these things on to the next generation. Um, so because, you, you know, I mean, a lot of us come to these teachings, etc. way later in life, much later in life. So what are some tips that you would give maybe to be parents, current parents, about how you bring up children with wisdom, with loving kindness, compassion, and, you know, reducing negative emotions, things like that, if you could elaborate a little bit upon. Parents, you know, although I don't have a very special experience of living with children, but I do have some because Many of my cousins, they all have children, you know, just this morning one of my cousins called me saying, okay, are you there in the beginning of June? I'm coming with my son, <laughs> so they are going to stay with me, so I get a chance to learn the behavior of these small kids. So, <coughs> they are very naughty, I know that, yeah. <laughs> and then I've also like giving talks and teachings to parents in Dharamsala several times and visit many, many schools. Right now, I'm supposed to be the chairman of the Tibetan government's education council. So because of that, I have to give talks. And in order to give talks, you need to learn from books and from people. So I have a little bit knowledge. So my, I don't think I have any particular suggestion, but I would say that uh, you implement what you preach, number one. The small kids, they, they, they look innocent, they look, you know, <coughs> Uh, innocent and not grown up, but st still they are very clever. They are basically watching you. They are not listening to what you are saying, not much. But they watch you. If you are compassionate, they will become compassionate. If you keep on... I have I've seen some parents who just give endless talks. Do this as a junker, as a nigger. Don't do like that, do like this. Yeah, so like much after the child, you know, constantly bombarding them with instructions. Do this, don't do that. No, no, don't do that. For me, I think this is not a good way. Give them their time. Give them their time. Right? And be a good example. And then also, when you say no, it should be no. This is also important because I've seen in my own like family, in, uh, when I go to see them, they have many, many children. <laughs> so I'm surrounded by children, you know. So sometimes I see, you know, these four, five little kids lying down and in front of them there is one mobile, all of them watching them. You know? And then the, I tell the parents, why the hell you give this mobile phone to these kids? Let them watch something on the television. Then they say, oh, if, if we don't give them mobile phone, they will cry. So what? Let them cry one time. If you say no means no, they understand it. They will never ask you again. 
if you am lo hindi me bolta hai na khinchitan karta hai na am lo khinchitan you give little bit then say no you give little bit then then the child children also know that i i, I find my way <laughs> so wo nahi karna chahiye when you when you are strict be strict no means no they will understand it so these are some of the small things that <laughs> suddenly came up in my mind which may or may not be useful and then uh, of course of course you know it depends upon their age you know when they when they grow up then they say i think it is in the chanakya niti also chanakya niti also that when they, when they are they are really small then like parents your children then when they grown up then then like your 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 friends then still grown up then maybe your equal you know like that okay yeah yeah namaste gishala um i would like to share my gratitude mm. for uh, this teaching and mm. uh, this is really a treasure mm. from the darkness to the light mm. and uh, i would like to apologize first of all that i gonna touch this topic mm. but i have to <laughs> mm. so life is not only about the loving kindness and compassion it's also about the sorrow and the grief because how we can really experience true happiness without having experience of deep sufferings but from another side nothing good nothing bad so i would like to share that uh, i'm from ukraine and i'm going to go back there soon and uh, to share dharma which i receive here but my knowledge my knowledge is very limited but anyway i will try to do my best and unfortunately a uh, uh, world forgot about this special operation for the salvation of the poor ukrainian people um the news also shows nothing about it uh, cause focus now in another important things which going uh, going in the world but any every day at least uh, hundreds of the drones try to destroy the peace of ukraine and some of them manage to hit the civilian houses and infrastructure every day we live under the fear that probably my house will be next and uh, buddha teaching are great and definitely practical but people in ukraine are drived by negative emotions like hatred fear anger a deep sorrow less of them interested to receive this wisdom but if they will receive definitely they, there is a big potential to enlightenment uh because now they know what the real suffering is so there are a lot of women which lost their sons fathers brothers in the name of the freedom and every day they scared to lose and afraid that some of men's or family won't come back home in addition the men are dying in this battle they are also kidnapping by the military against their will from the streets so those women in a deep sorrow and the fear every second every day This is a reality now in a days in Ukraine. So my question is what will be your message to those women which are in deep sorrow and grief from their lost and from those who are afraid to lose their dearest every day and how to be happy for them today. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. As I said easier said than done. Very easy to talk about these things but when you actually encounter a problem and difficult then it's not easy to implement and practice many of these things but having said that in buddhism we talk about using the heart and the head that means even in difficult times you should not lose your hope and use your head brain and see under such a situation what is the best to do instead of sitting there feeling sad sorry I understand but like like i'm i'm a tibetan a country which has lost one and half million tibetans one and half million tibetans lost their life under chinese invasion i myself when i remember when i was a small kid being chased by the chinese army running i do have those nightmares sometimes even today so i know all this but then you know there are things we cannot immediately so unfortunately right and this is not the case that nobody cares about ukraine but we also care about ukraine but there's nothing much we can do the only thing is when we meet some ukrainians here you know we the teach and uh, say nice things and uh, i never went to ukraine but uh, uh, a big delegation before the war came to dharamsala including one ukrainian minister 
they wanted to start the sea learning, social, emotional, ethical learning started by His Holiness. And they have actually started it there. So they're very, very well maintained, good people are there. So it's unfortunate that such things are happening. But, but Dharma is needed, or good ways of thinking is needed when uh, we have tr- problem and you know, difficulties. When everything's okay, we don't need Dharma. <laughs> You need medicine when you are sick, not when you are healthy. So sometimes it is also useful not to just focus on Ukraine alone, but also think about many other countries who are also equally suffering. Be it Israel, be it Palestine, be it, you know, whatever. There are so many countries who are suffering because of this, because of that. And sometimes there is a country where there may be no war, but people are dying through all kinds of diseases. So this is a part of human life, you see. Unfortunately, and then as I said, in the future, what we need, what we all need to, you know, do is to try to minimize the man-made sufferings, like the flood that is right now having in Dubai, the flood that is right now having in Shanghai in China, the flood that is happening in Mexico right now. This is this morning's news. So all these things are there, everywhere, some problems are there. So, so we should really like uh, grow up and mobilize human thinking so that we don't make discrimination between country to country as much as possible. I, I know, for example, when the Ukrainians are here in the, in, in the library, we have Russians studying there, Ukrainians are studying there, and they, they, they have no enmity, no hatred, ordinary people like that. They, in fact, many of these Ukrainians are basically Russians, or some of the so-called Russians are Ukrainians who moved there, you see. Unfortunately, because of such tragedy, you, you make this stupid you know, distinction, but you can't really make a distinction, right? So therefore, it is important that uh, whatever may be the decision of different governments, but uh, for, for people, we should not make this discrimination as much as possible. Understand, we need to understand that mistakes are committed not by one person, committed by everybody, right? So, yeah, so, so I think it's important to think from a really larger perspective and, uh, and find for yourself what is the best to do under such, such a situation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, where's okay. your microphone? Okay, yeah. Over here. Thank you, Keshala, yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, I also want to give a moment of silence out of respect Mm. for those suffering directly by war Mm. in this moment. Mm. Okay. I wanted uh, some further explanation on how we designate space. How we designate space? Yeah. We designate space by saying that space is the mere absence of obstruction mere absence of obstruction. Anything, <laughs> absence of obstruction, that is, we call it a space. Okay, yeah. Next question. Over the side. Yeah. Okay. I'll give short answers, yes, no, then it will click. <laughs> say our grief and our sorrow is the one thing that unifies us. We all experience death. We all experience loss. Yes. It's a very human experience and we can use this as fertile ground for transformation to bring us together and, 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 and that's the only way I, s- I see true. this. Very yeah. true. Yeah, as I said, suffering is introduction to happiness. You know, and I give you the example of a group of people from different nationalities travel, traveling in a small boat in a turbulent sea. People from different countries traveling together in a small boat in a turbulent sea when there is a question of, when they are facing the question of life and death. At that time, it doesn't make any sense to make discrimination between different countries. Right? So we are indeed living in a turbulent world. So it doesn't make 
sense to make discrimination among each other. Right? And also, honor the losses, the small losses that we have individually and collectively. I'm sure this will help in our own letting goes and attachments and all of those things. Um, so it's just expanding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes time, but, but these are all learning experiences. For example, there was a time when nobody talked about uh, human right. The concept of human right came much later, right? Similarly, similarly nobody talked about protecting the environment. There was nobody who talked about the right of women. Now all these are there. So, so we are learning, you know, how much women struggle to get their right. I read many articles on how women struggle to get their right. And I've recently at least, you know, commissioned uh, to, to a young Tibetan scholar to write a book on Tibetan women. So he's doing research for two years and writing a book on Tibetan women. So it's impo important to tell the story. Right? And even in like the honouring of loss, I love the way in, in many cultures, in Western culture, we don't kind of, um, we grieve and we have the funerals when people die and things like that. But loss, like in, could you talk a little bit about how um, death is honoured um, in Tibetan culture, like some yeah, of the rituals yeah. and things like yeah, that yeah. you have? Yeah. No, death, 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 is, death is the the other side of the coin of the living, two sides of the same coin. And death, <laughs> death actually is happening with all of us from the second moment of the birth, death is happening. Therefore, great teachers like Arya Deva, who wrote in his 400 verses, the so-called living, he says, the so-called living, whoever you are, the so-called living is nothing more than one moment of mind. The so-called living, whoever you are, is nothing more than one moment of mind. And people don't know this. Therefore, it's very difficult to find somebody who knows himself and herself. Right? Now, this is scientifically proved today that you are changing every day. And I told you this, probably, maybe this time, maybe not. I told you this story of somebody who was imprisoned, a criminal who was imprisoned, and after seven years he said, okay, now I am a different person. Please let me go. Because he had heard the scientific explanation that after seven years not a small trace is left of the earlier you. Complete change, that is what the science say. So therefore this gentleman, the criminal, must have heard about this. So after seven years in prison he said, I'm completely different person, let me go. <laughs> so that's the advantage of <laughs> So how would you explain that? Are you completely different person or same person? This is the question of continuity again comes here, is <laughs> right? Yeah. So, the, so the important thing is understanding. Understanding. All kinds of suspicions, fears that we have in the world is, as I mentioned earlier, one because of attachment. And I, I cited you this words from. Again, uh, Bodhisattva way of life. Where Shanti Deva says, I've completely given up attachment to anything. Therefore, I have no fear to death. No fear, he says, no fear even to death. Forget about other fears. I've completely abandoned attachment. Therefore, I don't have fear even to death. Then if you read Heart Sutra, 
there is a line where it says, if you have this mental obscurations of negative emotion and so forth, then you have fear. And this line reads, similar, deeper may be taqwa may do. When your mind is free from those obscurations, there is no fear. Now, how when your mind is obscured? Or when you have misconception, how do you develop fear? There is a, this is really there in the Madhimika and other texts. When we talk about emptiness, there is a very good example there. And I recently read one. I was reading a book full of Indian stories. So this book actually tells the whole Indian story, which was briefly mentioned in the Buddhist texts. So this story says there was one Indian teacher who was teaching some of his disciples uh, near near the river. He would get, get some gurukul, as we say it, the guru, the teacher, and some students. They sit outside and give some teachings. <laughs> At the end of the teaching, the guru, you know, asks one of his students, "Okay, take this book and put it on the table in my living room." The student goes and comes back, comes back frightened, saying, Guruji, I can't go there because there is a snake lying at the foot of your table. Then the Guru said, okay, now I give you a mantra. Recite this mantra and then the snake will run away. Then put the book on the table. So he goes you know, reciting the mantra, but still he sees the snake. She said, mantra didn't work. Then the Guruji said, okay, take this lamp. Then we took the lamp and went approached the table. He found there is no snake but a coil of rope. This is such an amazing example. Mind-blasting example, I would say. <laughs> because, you see, there is no snake at all. But because when you are not able to see the reality, you develop same fear as if there is a snake. So this is all created by misconception of reality. Such a powerful example. So that's why I was saying many of the sufferings that you experience, many of the fears that you develop are because of lack of knowledge. That's why wisdom has always been compared to a torch, to a light. When you, when you put the light on, then you are able to see precisely who is there, what is there, you know, where should I go, where should I should not go. So you need to have this light of wisdom. Find things for yourself. Don't just follow what people say. Right? Okay. Next question. We have a question online. Yeah. Um, yesterday, when I was swimming in the river, I saved five flies from drowning. And at the same time, that thought occurred to me. Did I deny food to the animals in the river? Since everything is connected, who <laughs> am I to decide what is good and bad? I ask this question with the thinking about my volunteer work. I'm doing for an NGO what is supposed to support women living in rural West Nepal. Sorry, I ask this question. Oh. Thinking about my volunteer work I'm doing for an NGO that is supposed to support women living in rural West Nepal. And here two questions arise. Are we Westerners really bringing about an improvement in this region? How do I know what effect our actions will have, especially in long term? How do I know from a limited human mind perspective that my actions will have a pure positive effective effect sorry for life on earth thank you and this is a question of ruti on her food online thank you ruti so this question reminded me another story there was a very interesting encounter between a tibetan woman and a monk so the monk wa was invited in that room. So in Tibet, you know, in, in ancient times, and not only in Tibet, others also, 
because of cold climate, people don't wash very often, things like that. So your hair is infested with lice, right? <laughs> don't sneer. We all used to be like that one time. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> so this elderly woman picks one lice and asks the monk, please throw it somewhere where it will not die. The monk, of course, had studied some Buddhist philosophy and logic. Then he said, my dear mother, if there's a place where we can throw, where nobody dies, first throw me there. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my answer. You know, in, in you, yeah, it's good, really, you accept those uh, bugs from the water, swimming pool. But, uh, yeah, so, so when, where, where, where are you going to put it? Don't just throw it, then it's dangerous. Put it somewhere where you think they will survive. It happens with all of us, and I do this almost every day. I see some bugs there, then I make sure that I, it goes into a green grass or something like that, you know. <laughs> so that you have to see, but there's no 100% guarantee that it will not die, and not necessarily because of you. You know, even in the swimming pool, they will die. If you don't take that out, somebody will come and clean it, you know, and flush it through the drainage, you know. And then also helping others. As I mentioned earlier, if you're completely enlightened, then you know what, they, what people need today, what people need in the long run. But we are not Buddha. But still we can use our human brain whether this is helpful or not helpful. It is important to see. It's not enough that you want to help. See whether it's really helpful or not. Use your brain. And the most important thing is have correct motivation. Some people in the name of helping others actually helping themselves. I know those kind of people also. They say, I'm, I'm here to volunteer to help, but actually they are seeking job. <laughs> There are such people also. I've, I've met some people like that also. So it should not be like, like wrong motivation. Right? Okay? Yeah. Hello. Hey. Thanks a lot for your teachings. Mm. I've personally find it also very inspiring how modestly you are delivering them. And my question is about what you mentioned about um, subject and object. You mm -hmm. mentioned that and I couldn't quite follow that, so maybe you could repeat it a bit more slowly. Thanks. Subject and object. In the whole process of Buddhist philosophy, there is attempt to understand the reality of the object. There is also an attempt to understand the subjective mind. Then, and on the third category, there is an attempt to see how the mind, you know, perceives the object. And then there's a fourth area where it uses reason, seeing how best I can precisely understand that object. So that is the, the process of uh, Buddhist teaching. Right? So when we say subject and object, the object is called object because it's, it is perceived by some subject of mind. From that, per, from that point of view, that subject of mind is also object because it's, it is perceived by some other mind. So, so it is clearly said, if anything is existent, that definitely is an object of the valid cognition. Right? So there is, in, on the one hand, we may make some distinction, but on the more you know, subtle level, we can't make distinction between subject and object, because there's nothing that is not you know, uh, perceived by a subject to mind. So anything that is perceived by a subject to mind, that is called object, object of knowledge. Okay? Yes? 
work question. Mm. I just have an offering. Mm. Um, some of us here wrote something for you in a postcard, so can I just come and offer Thank that? Thank you, to? yes, I will cherish it. <laughs> and I hope it will not boost my ego. <laughs> Recently, I was giving some talks and teachings in uh, New York, uh, which also has a library uh, started by Karmapa. And uh, then around the end of the teaching, His Holiness Karmapa sent me a, a very beautiful poetic composition supporting and praising my activities. So I'll cherish these things. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something about the vibrational uh, shift of consciousness? Vibrational shift of consciousness. Consciousness is, I don't know, vibrational shift of consciousness. Uh, consciousness is basically, like any other thing, it is impermanent. It is shifting and changing all the time. The moment it sees one object, then the next moment it sees another object. It, it, is, it is moving all the time. And it is dip, this, this shifting is happening because of whether you use the word vibration or not, it is, it is that shifting is taking place because of certain factors, causes and conditions. You can call it vibration or whatever. You know, because of the circumstances, situations, energies around, vibrations around, causes and factors around, the mind keeps on changing. So therefore, for a good Buddhist practitioner, you know, no matter how vibrational <laughs> or disturbing the environment, he should make sure that the mind does not get disturbed. Right? So therefore, Tsongkhapa, the one who wrote these three principal aspects of the path, he said, through your practice of one-pointed meditation and analytical meditation, gradually you should reach a stage where when you ask the mind to stay on one object, it will say, yes, sir, I will stay there. And it will stay there like a mountain. That is, that is the state of you know, achieving one point in concentration. So no vibration, <laughs> no disturbance can disturb you. When you place it, stay there like a mountain. When you ask the mountain, don't stay there like a stupid mountain. Go around, help others, develop love, compassion. It says, yes, sir. So the mind, the point is the mind becomes very obedient and serviceable. You have control over your mind. You know, if you say, sit down, it will stay still. If you say, go around to help, it will go. Right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Namaste. <coughs> Uh, thank you again mm -hmm. for all of your knowledge and wisdom. Um, I have a question based on oh, domesticating animals. Mm. Um, I grew up working with animals mm. and training horses more specifically and have since moved away from a competitive career as I started to see a lot of people mistreat animals in terms of trying to gain further in their competition and may, maybe not treating them with the best respect. And I, But I still work with animals and I try and share more education on kinder trainings and um, animal well-being. But what is the Buddhist idea or view on like domesticating animals in general in terms of like when an animal gets to a point where we believe they are suffering and they maybe need to be euthanized or when we take them out of their natural environment and bring them into our homes and yeah what is your view on that yeah, again it depends upon your motivation because some people they give it animals birds etc so that they can show it around to people they can make a display of it <laughs> some people Right? Like, for example, you have this, uh, you keep fish in a glass. It looks beautiful, right? So this is just uh, another display piece. So I don't 
think this is a good thing, taking them from their natural water and putting it in a, in a box with limited water. And uh, so this is one example. So similarly with other pets also. So it's again, you have to check your motivation. Your motivation, if your motivation is really not for make a display of it and uh, not to make money from it or whatever, you know, not for personal benefit, but simply to help this suffering sentient beings, then I think it is good, generally speaking. But, it, but then, you know, there are others who don't feel comfortable when somebody is keeping like hundreds of dogs in the next, you know, yard. <laughs> so, I don't know, you need to think about that also a little bit. Yeah, I don't know. You should, you should judge the situation, judge the situation. So whatever you do, do it so that you really have this motivation to help and nothing else. Right? Similarly, treating, treat, you know, treating beggars. You know, helping beggars is generally good, but sometimes, you know, by helping them, you are actually encouraging the country to have more beggars. <laughs> there are many people who don't like to work and get free food, free clothing, you know. If you get free food, free clothing, why should you work? <laughs> right? So, so you need to, I, I can't really say this is the solution. You need to judge the situation properly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here. Geshla, um, thank you for your teachings. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, over the last few centuries we have seen quite an increase in the human population, mm. whereas we have also seen certain species disappear, mm. like animals disappear. Um, so from a Buddhist point of view, it would mean, I guess, that more beings have created the causes and conditions to be reborn as a human? Mm. Or, um, so... What I'm wondering is how much control do we actually have on this planet? Um, and people say population control, there's too many, too many humans, too many, um, or we need to protect the animals. But how much control do we actually have when the causes and conditions um, are in place, you know, to be reborn as a certain being? No, 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 we have full control. And His Holiness said, if you want to reduce the world population, make, make more monks and nuns. <laughs> non-violent, non-violent population control. <laughs> but then in the case of Tibet, Tibetans get worried if more monks and nuns are there. You know, there's again problem, you see. Too small population. So it depends on the, again on the situation, right? Then also, when we talk about precious human life, this question has been asked to me and others many times by saying, look, in Buddhism we say precious human life, but human life doesn't really look like precious. Now our population is increasing. But I think when we say precious human life, precious human life primarily not in the context of having a human mind, but somebody in addition to having a human mind uses that human mind for doing good things then your life is really precious otherwise your life is opposite to what is precious what is opposite to precious ah huh? nasty <laughs> something like that yeah then life is not precious so therefore, just, just by increase of population doesn't mean the precious human life is increasing. That's one thing that we need to remember. And then also, scientifically speaking, wherever there is more facility, <laughs> more people come there. <laughs> so now the world has more facility. You know? So, so there is more population increase. Even from some other planet, they might get attracted, saying, okay, now let us born as a human being. You know, it's like somebody from poor country moving to a rich country, you know, something like that. 
Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So so like uh, I mean there may be in other 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 planet people who are in sentient beings in other planet may also be coming here. So everything is possible. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. last three days. Yeah, yeah, ask, 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 ask. <laughs> ask quickly, ask quickly. Yeah. Whoever, no problem. Gisla, Whoever. Actually, hi, Gisela. I want to know about, uh, my question is regarding mind. What Sp happened? Speak on the mic. It's not on. I think. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, Gisela, hello. My question is regarding, <laughs> my question is regarding the mind. What happened with the mind after the death? as I know that the Buddhism is not believe in souls. If the mind destroyed after the death, then where the theory of rebirth came in the Buddhism? This is my question. I explained earlier this, continuity. We don't believe in a soul, meaning permanent soul or permanent mind, but we believe in continuity. Just like the river I told you. So the, the river is not permanent, but it continues from snow mountain to the ocean. So similarly, the mind continues. And there is no reason why this, this continuity should come to, an, come to a stop. So it's the continuity of the mind. Not permanent, but continuity. For example, if you take a, a lump of mud, okay, then prepare a pot from it, clay pot from it. Then that lump, shape of that lump, you know, mud is destroyed, it becomes another shape, like a pot, but still the mud is there. Then later you dismantle the pot. Again, the shape of the pot is gone, but still the mud is there. So that way it, it, is, it continues. So I think both the mathematicians and uh, scientists, when they talk about law of conservation of energy, Nothing is lost. They only change the shape and things like that, but nothing is lost. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh. So when we reach Nirvan, uh, you said that it's going to stay. So will it also hold on for several lifetimes, uh, like until the end of our lifetimes? Yeah. I mean, in a way that when we get reborn as a baby, is then the baby enlightened? And then also, is there someone who is enlightened currently and is giving teachings? There are many. Most of us are not enlightened. And once you have achieved the nirvana, then that is permanent happiness, I said. Right? Then there is no falling back into the samsara whether you're in the form of a baby or old man, whatever form you are, but your mind is pure, you have removed all the negative emotions. So that is permanent happiness. But we don't call it, as I said, when we talk about nirvana, this is not equal to becoming completely enlightened, Buddhahood. Okay, you, you, you may be somebody who achieved nirvana, but you are still not Buddha. So that's different. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Keshla. Mm. Um, thank you so much for your teachings. Mm. Uh, they have been very insightful and inspiring. Mm. Mm. Uh, I'm sure everybody here is ready to go home and try and implement the teachings and their readings into their lives. Mm. Uh, a lot of things I've learned here have made my life philosophy a lot clearer and a lot more has just been confirming what I already knew mm. but have been struggling for years to implement. Mm. In here, things are easy. Most of us think similarly and there are little distractions to help us reflect and stay on the path of Dharma. The thing is, when I eventually go home, uh, I'm sure a lot of people will feel the same, I'm faced by a world and a society where Bodhicitta is somebody who's entrepreneurial, beaten the system and made a lot of money. And the path to enlightenment is how many beers you can down in half an hour. Um, and these habits are encouraged by our elders. I know my dad was proud when I got drunk for the first time. Um, our Buddha is celebrities, influencers, 
Pop stars who sing about sex, drugs, and attachment are put on literal pedestals with massive speakers blasting bass to worshipping fans, resonating the same energies uh, that chanting or oming does. We're followed, uh, we followed the path to liberation, except it's sexual liberation, and the meditation practice to get you there is casual objectifying sex. But if that doesn't work, you can always reach nirvana by the countless different substances you can get. Our karma overlords are just people in suits overtaken by greed, who love that we suffer because people who suffer are easier to sell to. We are at a point now where they have access to all our information, and the human condition has been studied for so long, they can make products instantly addictive and guaranteed to sell. Take our phones, for example, which take all our attention, and nobody thinks they can live without, yet we've been without them for seven days and nobody's dropped dead. People look for a guru and turn to TV and are taught by programs that play with our emotions and are full of propaganda to continue the cyclic existence of attachment and ignorance. We are not busy, we're bored, and we're so directionless that we can easily be exploited. Our faith has been taken and replaced by the insanity of capitalism and greed. Yet I know when I go back, I will be called weird for not wanting to participate and renunciate these short-term pleasures. In a world where people take refuge in porn, junk food, consumerism, and mindless scrolling, it can feel impossible to remember the teachings, let alone stick to the path of the true Buddha. Um, this seems to affect everyone around me. How is an unenlightened being with an overactive mirror neuron, uh, or mirror neurons, meant to continue their path to end suffering and the cyclic existence in this sort of world without running to a mountain, shaving my hair off, and hiding? Do you know anyone to be successful in their practice uh, in the UK, at least that's where I'm from, and how have they done it? Uh, how do I find a community near me to help me keep my practice? And also, what do you think about the idea that we can only be spiritually fulfilled in our mother country's religion? Should I be going to church? Thank you. Very good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> The Buddha, the Buddha said, don't, don't do anything that is a negative, do everything that is positive, completely transform your mind, this is my teaching. Okay, I think this answers many of your observations, because not to do bad things, do good things, you need to control your mind, that's the point. When you have control over your mind, you're becoming a celebrity, it's not the problem. The problem is how are you going to use your celebrity title, name, you know, wrong way or right way. If you use it the right way, then you, you are on a very high pedestal, privileged position. You are a singer, pop singer or whatever, whatever, you know. You can use it. You, you can influence many people. But if you use it the wrong way, you can destroy the life of many people just for your name and money and things like that. Right? Then with this... Uh, uh, Mirror neuron also, you know, it is clearly acknowledging Buddhism that we behave, you know, we copy each other, we are like monkeys, you know. But that doesn't mean that you can't change, that doesn't mean you continue to do the same thing, saying that, okay, my brain is like that, no. Now scientists are even saying that you can change your brain. The other day I spoke about the neuroplasticity. So don't just sit there that this is a mirror neuron and so. I reflect what others are doing. You are compelled to do what others are doing. Not just like that. You can change. You can change. That's very important. You can change. Right? So the most important thing is what is good for us? Temporarily, long term, for me, for others, for the world. Look at that. Then do all those things which is good and don't do those things which is bad as I already mentioned. <laughs> so you put it very nicely. Thank you. Okay, here is one. I saw, I saw her hand for a long, long time. Yeah. Yeah. Because she's in front of me, I could see it, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, because you touched on it already. Um, one thing that I've struggled with in Buddhism in the past is, and I, I don't know much, so I don't really know the history of this, but um, the differences between the way that men and women are treated, the rights of monks. Men and? Men and women yeah. 
the rights of monks and nuns. Yes. I don't really know the history very well. Yeah. Or the belief that a rebirth as a mm. man is better than a rebirth mm. as a woman. Mm. So I'm just curious if you could talk about that a little bit. Mm. I'm also curious if the person you commissioned to write the book about Tibetan women is a woman. Mm. And if you have any recommendations for books by Tibetan women, because all the books that I've read here have been by men, mm. and there's a couple of books by Western women upstairs, mm. but I've not seen any by Tibetan mm. women. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, there is some kind of, uh, if you read the Buddhist, many of the Buddhist commentaries, teachings, there is some little bit differentiation between men and women. Now here you need to understand any religion, whatever religion it is, it is born and brought up in a particular culture. There's no religion which is not influenced by its culture. So Buddhism, when it was, you know, taught in India and flourished in India, the culture itself has some differentiation between men and women. So that influence is very much there. We don't have much time to explain in detail. But then realizing all these differentiations, later on, if you read Kala Chakra Tantra, in the precepts of the Kala Chakra Tantra, there is one precept where it says, uh, if you affront, look down upon women, this is breaking vow. This is not said with the men. Realizing that the women are a little bit, you know, uh, not properly taken care of. So in order to show the equalness, that statement is there in the Kala Chakra. Now today, he sold in the state Dalai Lama, in the Tibetan government, he made it he made it a point to at least have two, three Tibetan ministers. Right now, the Tibetan government has only four ministers, three women. Then also in terms of study, His Holiness said the women must have opportunity to study like the, the other monks. They should also have this geshe. So we already have now the first, second, I think three, four batches of Geshe mass equal to Geshe. That's already there. Then if you're more interested, the library has already published three, four books on Tibetan women, which are written both by men, women, not just by men, written by men, women. But of course we can't anywhere, you can't make a clear cut discussion, you know, decision, okay? <laughs> right, so it is there. So. The most important thing is, His Holiness has repeatedly said, the more important thing for women anywhere is not just say that we don't have this opportunity, we don't have this privilege. The most important thing is, you come, come forward. Take the opportunity, come forward. And when you come forward, this is at least true in the Tibetan society, and His Holiness clearly said, when you come forward, if there is an obstruction, tell me, I will clear that path. So that's important, that's important. Because when you talk about Buddhahood, Buddhahood is actualized by the mind. When we talk about your mind and my mind, I can't say this is man mind, this is woman mind. Both the mind has this femini feminist quality and uh, masculine quality, both are there, right? Okay. Okay, so we stop here, night. Enough is enough, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, now we do a short prayer. Mm. May those, may those who have fear be fearless. May those under bondage be liberated. May those powerless be empowered. 
May our hearts join in friendship. As long as space remains. As long as suffering of sentient beings remain. May I too remain to dispel their suffering. Thank you. Take good care wherever you go. Thank you so much for making time. Thank you. Again and again. Just when I picked up Gesila on the way up, Gesila said, Oh, and today, which was a Sunday, I should have gone to Tifa. I'm a board member there and the women's uh, conference, women's uh, association conference. I'm a board member? No, 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 nothing. That's it. <laughs> so, uh, Gesila chose to come to us. Thank you so, so much, Gesila. Yeah. We know how busy Gesila is. Yeah. <laughs> and we so honored to have you again and again. Please come back very, very soon, Gesila. Yeah. Hooray, it's done. <laughs> it, it depends upon what food you give. <laughs> And I wanted to thank so, so, so much also Geshe-la, if I may. 